Welcome to this penultimate lecture in, pub, in our public lecture series in fertility in the 21st century. This is a very special session talking about decisions made by individuals or couples around becoming parents whilst working or maintaining a career. a career. We have experts from psychology, human resources management, sociology and law this evening. And so to kick us off, I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Laura Adair, who is a senior lecturer in psychology and leads the gender, sexuality and relationships theme in the Center for Culture and Evolution. Her interesting work includes research into reproductive decision-making and how humans have evolved to favor a cooperative breeding model. Laura, thank you very much for your time this evening. All right, hi everyone. This feels like a very appropriately um, post-pandemic themed talk. Uh, so my work is uh, largely now, my work is focused on the topic of abortion. Um, but in general, I use evolutionary and feminist approaches within psychology to ask questions about how our social environment shapes our reproductive decisions and our reproductive experiences. And that includes a lot of things, but recently I've been focusing on abortion. Um, and so my approach to this, this broader topic about having it all, how can you have it all, it's, uh, it's relevant to what our first speaker was talking about. And for me and for my participants, it seems like it, it is impossible or impractical to have it all without social and community support. So I have some data that I want to share with you all today from an interview study with people with and without abortion experience, where I can talk about just how central our social networks are in shaping the way that we think about abortion and the way that we feel about abortion experiences. But more broadly, right, our social networks play this wildly impactful role in shaping the decisions we make about our reproductive lives and how those reproductive experiences feel to us when we are living them, when we are in them. Yeah, uh, my general approach, I talk to you about how social forces and social influences are particularly important in my work when I'm asking how people make decisions about their family constellation and if and when to have children and if and when to terminate a pregnancy. I am often referencing how critical forces of social influence are in that particular experience. So my research tends to lean on one specific model about how our social world affects our reproductive lives. That's the cooperative breeding model. And it really is just a formal model of the idea that it takes a village, that compared to other species, human offspring are really expensive to care for. They take a really long time to develop to maturity um, and with humans, given relatively short interbirth intervals, a single person could be responsible for caring for multiple children that need a massive amount of investment at the same time. So there are a collection of evolutionary theorists, uh, anthropologists, psychologists, demographers that have asked, how did ancestral humans solve this problem of taking care of extremely costly children? And they did so by distributing that cost, right? So this the idea of a nuclear family being normal from a human evolution perspective, it's very abnormal. It is a modern artifact of kind of modern society, modern settings. It is far more normal and natural in the context of human evolution for child care to be managed by multiple adults in someone's social network. So this specific project that I want to share with you all today, again, it kind of speaks to how important social forces of influence are in shaping how we think about reproduction and what our reproductive experiences are like. I'm focusing on abortion. Uh, we completed this study just this past summer, and we sampled folks through various community networks in primarily the Midlands and the Southern UK. And uh, we have half of our participants with abortion experience, half of our participants did not have abortion experience because we really wanted to capture both sides of the coin. How does our social world affect our beliefs and expectations about abortion? And how does our social world affect our lived realities of abortion? 
Um, so we, we interviewed those folks via Zoom and we use thematic analysis to identify patterns within and across our participants. But here, I'm just gonna focus on two themes for the sake of time and two themes that I think really speak to this topic of having it all and how the hell we can possibly have it all without social and community support. Next slide, please. So there are two big ideas that I wanna emphasize with this data. And both of these big ideas are talking about how our social networks shape the way that we think about abortion and how our social networks shape our abortion experiences. And the first big idea that my data can speak to is that social networks are powerful because they can restory abortion. Social networks have the power to decrease stereotyping and stigmatization of abortions and people who seek out abortions. Next slide, please. So we have a bunch of extracts from various participants. Um, and really all of these extracts were coded as containing this specific theme, this theme, exposure to abortion, and specifically the sub-theme reducing abortion stigma, what it captures in our participant data is that without exception, all of our participants when reflecting on how they thought about abortion earlier in their lives, during childhood, young adulthood, they all endorsed at least one myth about abortion. And there are lots of myths and misinformation about abortion, but for our participants, these were things like uh, people who get abortions are risky or immoral or promiscuous or do drugs, or drink alcohol, um, that abortion experiences are primarily traumatic and upsetting experiences, that abortion experiences will reduce or eliminate your likelihood to have healthy pregnancies in the future, all kinds of myths. But without exception, our participants, when reflecting on how they used to think about abortion, endorsed at least one of these myths. For participants that throughout their, their young adult lives, reduced the extent to which they stigmatized abortion and let go of some of these myths. They did so primarily because they were exposed to people's real lived experiences of abortion. So in our participants, in our data, for people who experienced a reduction in abortion myth endorsement in the extent to which they stereotyped or stigmatized people who got abortions, a key factor in that process was exposure to someone's real, nuanced, complicated, lived reality of abortion. So it, it decreased the extent to which our participants stigmatized these people, and it made the experience of abortion seem more real more personal. Um, so Reggie reflects that seeing someone go through it was comforting because they could see that it didn't change their opinion of that person who had an abortion. So they were comforted that maybe people wouldn't see them differently because of their own termination experience. And for Rachel, she used to endorse a ton of myths and stereotypes that really just simplified the reasons that someone would need an abortion because they're irresponsible, because they take a lot of risks. But exposure to someone's lived reality of abortion made her identify with that experience, that real lived abortion experiences are complicated and it could be me. It's people like me. Next slide, please. So the other big idea that I wanna talk about that my data can speak to is that uh, in our social groups, expectations and norms about reproduction, in this case, I'm gonna focus on abortion, but expectations and norms can shape our ability to engage with our support networks. So what we found is that among our participants, the extent to which they felt that abortion was stigmatized by members of their social network, by members of their community, they managed that stigma by socially isolating and using secrecy. And this was specifically for participants with a history of abortion experience um, and for participants reflecting on what members of their social network went through if they had a termination. For our participants, if they felt in their communities and their social networks that abortion was stigmatized, they would manage that stigma and avoid that judgment from members of their community 
by isolating, by keeping their experiences secret. Um, and this can lead to a host of negative outcomes. We've got, I mean, I had two participants share that that our researchers were the first people that they ex disclosed their termination experience to. Um, we have participants explaining that they would travel miles, uh, travel for hours to go to reproductive health clinics away from where they lived to keep their termination experience secret. And we have participants describing these experiences of trying to comfort others going through a termination experience when those friends, their peers, feel like they can't go to their family, their parents, or uh, their romantic partner about their experience. Thanks so much for, uh, for your attention.